Hello guys, today we are going to talk about Grasshopper for, for Rhino. Um, I will be using Rhino 6 for Windows. Um, this is the latest uh, commercial release for this uh, uh, amazing software. And uh, it already comes with Grasshopper inside, so uh, there is no need to install Grasshopper as a separate plugin anymore. Uh, and Grasshopper comes with an additional feature, which is the plugin Kangaroo for uh, physics simulation uh, inside uh, Grasshopper and Rhino. Uh, we won't be talking about plugins in this uh, basic course. Uh, we'll be uh, only discussing Grasshopper potential and uh, some basic Grasshopper structures like um, attractors and uh, paneling and, uh, and a combination of, uh, of the two. And uh, eventually, in the end, we will uh, talk about uh, mesh modeling with Grasshopper. Um, and uh, this is just in preparation of the uh, advanced course. Um, as always, I will not focus on uh, some kind of tutorial. Um, I'm, I will always focus on methods. So uh, what I'm going to, to uh, put inside this course is just uh, how understanding how Grasshopper works. Um, and in order for you to uh, to be able to uh, face whatever kind of uh, problem with Grasshopper, uh, even if it implies the use of some additional plugins. Um, so once you finish this course, you will have a comprehensive understanding of uh, Grasshopper, uh, let's say, a way of working and also uh, a, a strong understanding of uh, how to implement uh, Grasshopper scripts in order to do basically uh, whatever you want in your uh, practice. Um, in order to do this, the first thing we must point out is that Grasshopper is not a design tool, it's a coding tool. So you will not be designing things, you will be programming the design of, of things. Uh, this is very important because um, this means that uh, we will not be creating a one single three-dimensional model, we will be creating a whole family, a whole generation of three-dimensional models. And this is this is due to the fact that Grasshopper, uh, being a, a coding tool, allows to work with uh, variables and uh, variable types and functions and so on, uh, just like in a uh, line coding uh, environment. Uh, the uh, the thing that is uh, probably that has made Grasshopper great in this world is that it is a visual scripting interface. So you won't see uh, basically uh, not even one line of coding. Uh, you will be programming the design using nodes and and uh, connecting the connecting the nodes with wires. Um, so it's a very easy and and understandable uh, intuitive interface, uh, which allows to do to do uh, many great things. Uh, Grasshopper is uh, in Rhino 6 can be launched using this button here. Uh, so uh, this is what happens when you uh, launch Grasshopper. Of course, um, in my interface, you will see that I have a whole set of tabs here on top. But keep in mind that the standard Grasshopper installation goes from Params toolbar to Display toolbar. Everything you see here. Uh, you see that at some point you only see the, the initial letter for, for the plugin tab. It's because um, um, the amount of plugins is probably way too high. Uh, but uh, you see that these from Volvox on, these are all Grasshopper plugins. So Grasshopper is a plugin for Rhino, but it also has its own plugins that allows to uh, specify or go, let's say, into a more specific workflow inside Grasshopper, depending on the, the kind of tasks that you uh, must uh, do in your, in your practice. Um, so this is perfectly in line with the fact that Grasshopper is a coding environment. So you program the design no matter what type of, of application you, uh, you are into. But if you want to go into more specific applications, then you might want to look for a specific plugin that expands Grasshopper potential exactly towards the solution of your problems. Um, so how does Grasshopper work? I will uh, create a very simple definition here. You know, the definition is the name of, of the Grasshopper script, by the way. I will create a simple definition here in order to understand what's the potential of Grasshopper. Uh, so for example, I will create a, a point container. Uh, we, will, we will discuss the um, better way, the better workflow in order to work with this kind of tool in a moment. But for the moment, I will just create a simple definition, just creating a line here, 
by specifying the control points and then using the NURBS curve and then saying this NURBS curves I want it to be closed and then I will create a let's say a uh, boundary surface which is a surface from planar curves which is the basically the same comment that you have here in, in Rhino and then I will extrude this thing here in order to create a uh, solid object like this and so now I have this solid thing here and the thing is that if I don't like the shape of the thing of this thing of the client comes up with some weird uh, requirement which is uh, quite common then I have access to the whole uh, process so I have the points here that allow to change the curve and the curve affects the points position sorry and then it, this affects the resulting NURBS curve and also the uh, boundary surface that I have here at the bottom and then of course also the extrusion which has its own height here which I can uh, change using this uh, this slider okay of course um, the behavior in grasshopper is the same as in Rhino so if there are some things that I cannot do in Rhino then the same things will not be possible in grasshopper so let's say for example that I am creating right now what I'm getting from this workflow is a closed B rep uh, we will discuss this uh, in, in a moment uh, which basically means a solid uh, shape um, but for example if I take one of these points and move it up then the boundary surface is just uh, fails to create a boundary surface because it only works with a, a, a planar loop of uh, a closed planar loop of curves so you see that this is not planar anymore so this cannot create a boundary surface which cannot be extruded okay and even even if it uh, was able to extrude the incoming surface we will we will not be getting a solid anymore because rhino cannot cap automatically a non-planar loop of curves as the edges of an extrusion okay so if i take for example this curve and send it to rhino and try to create a solid extrusion you see solid yes and then i say i want this height here uh, you can see that the, the surface is not closed okay so the solid is not closed because Reno cannot cap this space uh, automatically okay so you see that um, that grasshopper has the same limitations as Rhino because basically it is Rhino so we are just creating a parametric workflow inside grasshopper in order to avoid going back and forth with uh, uh, with gra with Rhino modeling in, in case we uh, by mistake do something that we didn't want to um, and in this case for example our parameters are let me undo this uh, uh, displacement for this point so I can go back to the working definition our parameters here are very it's very important to understand that parameter normally um, you might think of a parameter as a number uh, but you can see that also points are parameters in this uh, definition so we have geometric parameter here logic parameter here and the numerical parameter here so it, there is a whole set of parameters that we can use in in grasshopper and we will discuss this uh, in, in a while uh, of course if you um, if you want to be more precise even points depend on numeric parameters because they have their own coordinates and coordinates are numbers but you can see that we can also use exactly the initially the point because it is insane to define for example a set of eight point by their uh, respective coordinates so instead of uh, having to deal with 24 numbers we can simply deal with the geometrical points that we can drag around and have uh, the result changing accordingly okay so uh, of course we have numbers uh, behind everything but uh, in some in some cases we we can use the uh, geometric parameters in order to affect grasshopper definition um, so this is how grasshopper works basically we can um, uh, we can create a whole range of objects if, if considering the the final extrusion the final solid as the design that we want to create you can see that by simply changing the position of one point we are creating a different uh, a, a variation of this uh, of this solid so that's the point with grasshopper we can uh, program the design this is basically uh, a, a, a scripting workflow, even if it is in a, inside a visual interface. Uh, this is a scripting workflow that allows each function to work with an input and produce an output in this case. 
Okay, so we will analyze this in a while, but that's how Grasshopper works. So I will uh, just select everything and delete it, and let's start from scratch in order to have a clear understanding of what happens with, uh, with Grasshopper. Um, so Grasshopper is basically a, a programming interface, so we have access to Rhino um, objects uh, and Rhino functions inside Grasshopper by uh, accessing these tabs here. I will only consider the tabs between params and, and display um, for now. So you see that there is a first tab which is called params, there is a maths tab, set tab, vector tab, curves, surfaces, meshes, intersection, transform, and display. Okay, so these are the tabs that we are going to use right now. I do recommend that, especially for new users, I do recommend that you adjust the interface uh, a little. Uh, so first of all, you might want to right click in the uh, work area on the canvas of Grasshopper, then select preferences and go inside the interface section and activate this checkbox here which says show obscure components so what this uh, option does is visualize a whole set of buttons that normally are hidden in the uh, grasshopper tabs so if i deactivate this you see that the amount of functions visible is considerably less and if i keep this activated you see you have access direct access to a whole bunch of additional functions that are uh, completely visible Okay, so that's it for the uh, Grasshopper settings interface, show obscure components. And then you might want to go into the display, um, display menu here and activate draw icons and draw full names. So especially if you are starting to work with Grasshopper, I do recommend that you activate this and this. So what's the meaning of this? I will keep them deactivated in, uh, for, for a moment. So in the moment I place here a NURBS curve, which I already did, I see the text uh, command, okay? So I don't see the icon. But when I go into the toolbars, for example, I'm looking for the NURBS curve, which is in uh, curve toolbar. It's a spline curve. So you see that NURBS curve is actually in this tab here, in this group of comments. And this is its icon, okay? So it's exactly uh, the same, by the way, as the icon in Rhino, as you can see. Uh, so no surprise for, for this, but you see that this is the common, okay? So sometimes for new users, it's, it's uh, um, better to find the same aspect between the tab and the canvas, okay? So that's why I suggest you select the display draw icons, so you see that you have access or you, you visualize the same icon as in the toolbar. And also, I do recommend that you activate the, the draw full names because as you can see, the BDP and CLD uh, inputs and outputs are not clearly understandable unless you already know how this component or this, this function works. So if you hit the, this option like draw full names, you see that this NURBS curve asks for vertices, degree, and if the curve is periodic or not. And as an output, it gives you the curve length and domain of the curve. So it's, it's clearly understandable what the component or the function needs to work and what its uh, output is. Okay, so that's why I do recommend that you activate these and draw full names as well. Um, also, a few words about this label here that you see on top of my, uh, of my functions. Uh, this is actually the um, description of this uh, command. Okay? So this is very use useful and it only appears if you have this plugin here installed in your Grasshopper uh, setup, which is called Bifocals. Uh, and you see that in my standard template, I have bifocals uh, placed in the canvas and activated. Okay, so that's why you will see always see this label here on top of my functions. And by the way, if you get lost uh, and you must uh, put one of these functions in your canvas, then you refer to this label and not to the icon, because if you refer to the icon, you must know what command. Uh, is this and where to find it in the toolbars, so like this. But if you have this label here, you just double click on in, inside Grasshopper Canvas and then you just type what you see here and you will find the same command with the same icon and you can easily recognize that this is the command that I am using, okay? So if you get lost and you want to, um, let's say, um, insert or put uh, functions that you missed, just refer to the label, label here that you have on top of my functions. Okay, 
Um, speaking of which, if you need to install uh, the bifocals uh, plugin, uh, you might want to go uh, in, in. You might want to surf this website, which is called foodforrhino.com. Okay. So here you will find a repository of all the plugins that you might want to use for for Rhino and Grasshopper. Uh, all types of plugins, well, basically most of, of all the plugins for Rhino and Grasshopper are published on Food for Rhino. There are there are some plugins, actually very few plugins, uh, that uh, are available on, online on the internet and they are not present in Food for Rhino repository. But this is very particular cases. Uh, so uh, bifocals you will find it in foodforrhino.com okay so you must create an account and look for bifocals download it and then uh, simply install it in in uh, grasshopper and if you want to know how to install uh, plugins in grasshopper you simply surf my my website junkadm.com and you will find there in the blog there is, there are two uh, posts that refer to um, installing grasshopper plugins uh, in your uh, environment okay with all the indication and all the steps that you have to to uh, perform um, so this is uh, how a grasshopper interface looks like um, I will resume the the meaning of these tabs here from between params and display like this so params contain a whole set of uh, of functions which are uh, basically referring to data types so when you when you program something when you code something um, some functions will only work with some specific data type. So, for example, uh, you might know that when you create a NURBS curve in Rhino, you have to provide uh, the start point of the curve and then the next point, next point, next point, next point. So these are the control point of your curve. Now, think about the NURBS curve as a function. In order for this curve to work, you must provide vertices or points. So the, the type of, of uh, uh, data that this function needs are points. You cannot make this function work if you give the function, for example, lines. You cannot create an herbs curve starting from lines, okay, or starting from cylinders, for example. So the specific data type that you must use in order for this curve to uh, be created are vertices. Of course, you also have other params like the degree of, uh, of the curve, which is a number, okay? And the persistent close, which is basically the uh, periodic aspect of the curve. So if you want it to be closed or not, you see that this is a yes or no uh, um, param, okay? So basically here in the params toolbar, you will find all these data types. So you will have two main groups here, which is geometry and primitive. Uh, in geometry, you will find all the geom geometric data type, of course, and between them you have the point. Okay, but you also have circles, curves, planes, arcs, line, rectangles, B rep, mesh, and other things that we are not going to discuss right now. Uh, eventually, a few of them, yes, but uh, not all of them because they are uh, belong to eventually to plugins, additional plugins that I have installed, and and they don't belong to standard Grasshopper workflow. But anyway, you see here you have all the basic geometries that you might want to use in your uh, Grasshopper definition. So, for example, let's say we want to create a NURBS, like a small uh, introductory tutorial. So we will need vertices. So I must provide a, a point parameter here. And then you see that there are also pr uh, primitive, which are non-geometric parameters. So here you will find Boolean values, numbers, integer, text, color, and there are also some things that you might not understand right now, like the domain, for example. Uh, the file path is a non-geometric primitive, of course, if you must load some data from your uh, computer and, and stream them inside Grasshopper in order to perform some kind of geometric manipulation based on, on data, then you might want to use the file path in order to tell Grasshopper which file it, it must read. But anyway, you see that um, there are non-geometrical component or, or parameter as well. Um, so in this case, for example, we must provide the degree of the NURBS curve. And the degree is a number, but it is not a floating point number. This is the meaning of this 0.1 icon here. It is an integer number. You cannot create a, a curve, a NURBS curve, with a degree uh, being like 1.13, okay? So it is either 1 or, the, or, or 2, okay? So we must provide an integer uh, value here. 
Um, so this is a geometric parameter and this is a, a, a primitive, a non-geometric parameter. And you will find all of these things here in the params uh, toolbar. And there are also other things in the params toolbar which are uh, important for, um, for building Grasshopper scripts. So the uh, main one is the input group. So the input group is uh, uh, one of the most important because you, you basically won't create any definition without using at least one of these uh, components here. So you see that there are uh, inputs. Now inputs, normally uh, you can consider inputs like uh, in general numbers, okay, uh, for now. Then we will see that there are some uh, particular cases. But anyway, think about numbers in order to understand how the thing works. And the main input is of course the number slider. And if I take this and put it here, you see that I have automatically created a number slider between 0 and 1 with three decimal numbers here. Okay, so this is the uh, standard number slider that you can drag and drop from your toolbar to your canvas. Okay, um, so this is basically one component, one function that the only thing that is doing is emitting, outputting a number between zero and one with three decimal numbers. So that's the only thing that it does. The, it, it's emitting now one, only one single value, 0 0.163. Okay, so if we want to see the output of a component, like in this case, we can use a panel. So we grab a panel, place it in the canvas and plug anything you want inside the panel. And you see that the panel is visualizing the um, output of the uh, previous component, like the uh, description of the, uh, of the value. Okay, um, so the panel is, is number slider and panel are basically the main uh, input components that you might want to use in your definition. In order to understand how things work, you use the panel. And if you want to parameterize something, you use the number slider. Okay. So um, there are also other, um, other uh, functions here. Uh, there is the Boolean toggle that we, will, we were discussing just a few moments ago. Uh, for example, when we want to define if the curve is closed or permanent closed or not, this is the value that you might want to use. It's a switch, it's a toggle, so you double click and you get true or false, and you see that it emits exactly this value here. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. But anyway, this is very useful if you want to uh, create some, uh, let's say, Boolean behavior, like true, false, yes, no, uh, uh, zero, one. Okay. Um, so basically, we already have all the inputs that we need for our NURBS curve, as we will see in a while, but there are also other input um, components here. For example, just because we introduced the Boolean toggle, let's see the button here. So the button is like a, a Boolean toggle that has one standard position. So if you plug the button here, you see that it says false, and you can just hit this button and it becomes true, but temporarily, because when you release the mouse button, then it switches back to false, okay? So it doesn't uh, stay in the true uh, st uh, state, okay? Um, while the false or true Boolean toggle, it stays in, it, it preserves the status that you want once you double click on it, okay? So that's the difference. They both emit a true false value, but this is a permanent value. This is a temporary uh, value, okay? Um, and also, as we have seen the number slider, we can also grab some other, um, let's say, number emitter. Okay, so for example, the control knob, which is uh, more aesthetic uh, with, with, if compared to the number slider, but I find it less practical than the number slider. Um, we will see this in a while. There is the digit scroller, which is also another way of uh, creating one single value from a, a uh, well, I call it, it's not a, a slider, it is a scroller, but we will see this in a few seconds. Um, there is also the, the MD slider, which we will discuss uh, later on. And there is also an, a value list, which is some kind of another, um, let's say, a single bar uh, value generator, but we will discuss this in, in a while. Um, so all of these things here are number generators, okay? But this kind of these numbers are uh, basically, um, let's say, formatted like uh, to to for particular purposes, okay? The more general one is the number slider or the control knob. Uh, but um, if you uh, take a look at the way they work, I do prefer the number slider because it's pretty straightforward. You just 
drag this value here, you have a range defined here. While if you take the control knob, uh, it is basically uh, the same, but it is less practical to, uh, to um, change or to edit the values here because you have to uh, turn the mouse around instead of dragging simply a cursor left or right. So I do prefer the, the number slider. There is also the digit scroller, which is basically a number slider based on, on all these scrollers here. So the, the advantage of this is that it allows to um, uh, create a, a whole range of, of values where you just scroll one digit here and you see that you already have this uh, huge number uh, because it adapts, it considers the zeros not as null value, but uh, but as um, tens and thousands and hundreds and so on. Okay, so you just simply drag these, and then you have access to all of the numbers that you might want to need uh, in your in your definition. Of course, uh, in order to perform a, a a quick variation, in order to get a specific value, in this case you can double click the slider. For example, say that I want 0 0.75, I double click. Uh, the, the slider and type 0 0.75 and here we have the result while in this case you you can do the same here because and you must do the same here because if you are if you must change from 0 0.46 to 0 0.75 you must change individually these and these okay so you have to perform two operations while here you can just slide this value now, I do prefer this because not always we have three decimal numbers and we can just slide the cursor and have the desired value, okay? So, uh, we are now working with three decimal numbers, which is some, some, uh, something which is quite unusual. Um, it depends on the situation that you are uh, dealing with, but uh, I do recommend that you use the number slider unless uh, you um, must switch from... Uh, uh, very um, different values inside your, your definition, okay? Uh, then there is this, which is the MD slider. The MD slider produces a set of coordinates, basically. You can see that there is a set, which is represented by the curly parentheses. Um, so you have the first coordinate here, comma, second coordinate, comma, third coordinate, okay? So in this case, the MD slider is always uploading a couple of values. So you can see 0 0.5, comma, 0 0.5. The third coordinate would always be zero, uh, but uh, you see that you have a cursor here, which uh, at the same time changes two uh, out of three values. Okay, so it's like having a multi-dimensional slider. That's the meaning of, of MD. Okay, uh, in this case, it's a two-dimensional slider. So um, this is what the MD slider uh, does. We will uh, go into tweaking these sliders uh, later on. And the last one I want to show you is the value list component. Uh, I plug this here, you see I get one, and then I have the, the choice between two and three and four. So you um, can uh, customize this uh, value list component here in order to um, get exactly uh, uh, the value that you need or the values that you need. So you don't have a range here, you don't have a continuous change of one value to another. You have some separate values that uh, also might not be a sequence of value. So we might have one and then 13 and then 51 and so on. So you just switch between them and you use the value that you need in your definition. Uh, so it's a discrete set of, uh, of number, not a continuous set of number like in these uh, other cases here. Okay, so these are basically the main input generator. Of course, you also have some fancy inputs like calendar, clock, and then you have color wheel, uh, which are uh, very, um, let's say, uh, nice to see if you take a look at them. Um, but they are very, um, they, they are used for very particular applications. I don't think we are going to use them uh, in any case. But anyway, uh, if you need some, some a nice color picker, then we have it here. Um, and then there are some, um, let's say, um, generic functions like the uh, import or like the read file, which you can find in the input. So everything you see here is generating some input for Grasshopper functions. Okay. Now there is also this thing here, which is the false start toggle. Uh, this is very uh, important because um, I will place it here. Uh, since uh, Rhino 6 and Grasshopper 1, um, update the false start toggle had this kind of uh, bug here where the value uh, simply uh, 
hangs out from the component graphic. So you have this kind of, um, let's say, uh, weird situation. It's not like the Boolean toggle. But this is a very co important component. You can use it as a, a standard um, uh, Boolean toggle, as you can see. So you double click and it switch between uh, true and false. Uh, but the, the thing is that it is a false start toggle. So each time you uh, open the, the file, uh, the grasshopper file, this boolean toggle will switch back to false while this one if it is set to true will remain true okay so even if i set this to true and then i control c control v copy paste it you see that the copy is set to false automatically okay so this is the false start toggle why it is so important because some functions execute some very heavy calculation okay and uh, and they are triggered by a boolean toggle so if you, for example, let's say you have this uh, heavy calculation going on because you have a Boolean toggle set to true and then you save the file and close the file. Next time you open the file, the heavy calculation will start as soon as you open the file because the Boolean toggle will be set to true. So I do recommend that you use a false start toggle because even if you uh, forget to uh, put the, the toggle to false, Next time you open Grasshopper file, this will automatically switch back to false and your heavy calculation will be stopped uh, initially, okay? Now, the false start toggle, if I remember correctly, is not available on, on Food for Rhino, but I have it uh, shared in my uh, personal, uh, I think, Dropbox or something like that. So uh, I will put a download link in the description of this uh, of this video so you can directly download these plugins and install in your in your grasshopper because it's very important um, so yes these are the input okay now there are some general utilities that you can see here bifocals being one but there are some utilities that we can discuss uh, during the uh, the uh, initial sessions uh, the most important one is this one the param viewer okay so the param viewer is something that we will be using um, several times in in uh, our first sessions, especially uh, because it allow it allows to understand uh, exactly how data are stored inside Grasshopper uh, data sets. Okay, uh, which is something very very important because once again I remember we are going to code and to program the design, so we must deal with. Uh, lists of uh, of data, and we must understand how this uh, of, uh, how these data are uh, structured inside these uh, lists or data set in general. Okay, so we will be dealing with the param viewer quite a lot during our our course. Uh, and then you see here there are two additional groups that also depend on plugins. This is openness. This is robotics. Uh, we would not discuss this um, in this uh, in this course. So basically, uh, going back to our, um, let's say, uh, little workflow for creating a parametric nervous curve, I will uh, take all this thing here and then uh, uh, put it aside for the moment and will concentrate only in my, uh, let's say, true falses here, the integer and the point, because these will be the vertices for our curve, this will be the degree, and this will set if the curve is closed or not. Now, um, Let's understand how these uh, tabs work here. Um, they, are, they are basically groups of uh, thematic function. Okay, so for example, if you want to draw a NURBS curve, the NURBS curve, of course, of course, is a curve, so you might want to switch directly to the curve toolbar here. And here you have a whole set of uh, functions. Uh, they are uh, also grouped uh, by category, so you can see that there are analysis, uh, analysis function, division tool, primitive curves, spline curves, and utility for curves, okay? Uh, so switching between the tabs here is somehow very close to switching between Rhino tabs. So if we switch from standard to curve tools, you see that there are only comments related to curves creation and editing in your Rhino interface. So the same happens here. If we switch from params to curves, uh, uh, tab, you will only see comments or functions that are related to curves creation and or editing or analysis, as you can see. Um, so, uh, so, so it's very, uh, let's say, useful to switch tab if you want to only have access to uh, curves function. But you also can see that all these functions, that there are quite a lot. 
okay? And you don't see them all. You, you must click in this black area here in order to have access to the whole set of fun functions that you have inside the analysis group, for example. So it's not easy to, to find and, and uh, the, the right function inside uh, Grasshopper toolbar. But anyway, you can uh, proceed like this. Uh, you select the tab that corresponds to the type of, of geometry that you might want to work with. And then inside you have groups. You recognize that the uh, NURBS curve is a spline. So you go inside here and here you will find the NURBS curve. So if you want to work with, uh, with Grasshopper uh, toolbars, you better get used to this conceptual aggregation of commands. Okay? Um, and then you grab the NURBS curve. Or you just, once you know uh, exactly what command you want to use, you, you can also use Grasshopper command line, which is invisible normally. It's not like Rhino command line, which is all, always visible here or whatever you have it in your interface. But in Grasshopper, you don't have any visible command line until you double click here in the canvas. And then this command line appears or this field here. So here you can start typing, for example, I want to create a curve. So you start typing curve. Now, the problem is that um, if you if you proceed like this, Grasshopper will show you, uh, let's say, the best fitting commands that uh, uh, it has available. Now, in my case, as I have a whole bunch of plugins available, all these plugins have some comments related with curves. Okay, so Grasshopper is is showing me all the comments from all the plugins that I have installed, which contain the curve word. Okay, so you must be more specific than that. So if you want, if you know that you want to create a NURBS curve, then you type NURBS. Okay, and you see that NURBS curve is easily uh, accessible here from from uh, uh, the uh, curve toolbar because it's very specific here. Of course, you might want to type the whole command and have access exactly to the value here to the command here, but it's a nonsense. Okay, the, the trick here is that with with few letters, you already have access to the command that you need. Of course, um, knowing that if you type NURBS, you get better access to the function that you need, it comes from the experience, okay? So there is nothing that tells you if you type NURBS, you have a, a direct access to, to NURBS curve. It's just experience. So give it a try, uh, start typing different things related to one specific command and uh, understand what is the best combination of, of uh, letters or the best word that you might type in or must type in order to to access exactly the command that you need, okay? So in this case, it's NURBS and you have it here, okay? So I do recommend that you get used to double click and type thing here because it is way, way quicker than uh, looking for comments inside the, the Grasshopper interface. Um, so basically we have, we already have any, everything that this component needs to work because it asks for vertices, degree and periodic. Now let's see how to correctly uh, work with Grasshopper because you will find many tutorials or, or many uh, also courses that say, okay, now plug this here, now plug this there, and everything will work just fine. But I want you to understand what you must do when you work with a new component. So let's say that this is your new component here. So what we are going to do now is very, very important for, um, uh, for, for having a method of working with Grasshopper and uh, being able to face whatever kind of new situation you will you will run into okay so let's say this is your new component here and you want it to work okay so first thing you must do is not read these okay if you read this it's it's uh, it's clear now because we already talked about the nerves curve uh, for a while so you you already know what you must plug here in each of these three inputs okay but if you want to know how the component works, you must hover with the mouse on each input and see what information Grasshopper is giving you, okay? So first there is a black icon, which is this black hexagon here with a symbol inside. This black icons here is telling you what type of, of values you must provide in order for this input to receive the correct values, okay? And if you go into params, you see that you have exactly the same icon here in your geometry group. So what these vertices here is telling, I need points, okay? And this is very important because now we, we it's very easy to understand with the NURBS curve, but if you use whatever type of component, this is how um, you must um, understand what type of data this component is asking for. 
okay? So in this case, it asks for vertices, but you must provide points, okay? So that's why we placed a point container grabbing from the geometry toolbar here, okay? So we must plug this here. And then let's switch to the degree. The degree is asking for, see the black icons? It says seven. Now, if you, of course, this is a, a number. So if you go into non-geometric primitives like here, you will see that this corresponds to integer number, not number, okay? So that's why we grab the integer container and place it here and plug it here. And then it wants to know if the curve is periodic. You see that the, this time the icon is a circle half, half black, half white. You go into primitive here and you see that this corresponds to the Boolean uh, value. So it's a true false condition. And that's why we grab a false store toggle or a Boolean toggle, okay? Um, let's say you don't have the false start toggle for now, so we will use exactly the Boolean toggle, and here it is. Now, this component has all the three inputs already filled, but it is not working. We can see it is not working because it is getting orange, and this balloon here appears. Okay, so this is one status that tells, uh, tells us that the component is not working properly. Um, so orange is the color for components that have some problem. Okay, uh, there are um, three main status for, for a grasshopper component. Uh, one being orange, which is uh, the one that we are seeing now. One is gray, it means the component is working properly. It, it doesn't need anything more in order to work properly, so it is outputting its uh, output, basically. Uh, so we have uh, three orange components here. Um, this is NURBS curve, it is receiving information, or supposedly is the, it is receiving information uh, in order to perform the calculation that it must perform, and it's the right type of information because there are points, numbers, integer numbers, and Boolean values, okay? So this is orange, why? This is orange because these two are orange. Okay, so once a component is orange, it is not emitting any value. So if this doesn't emit any points, this will not receive any points, and therefore it, will, it won't be able to work. Okay, so this balloon here is saying input parameter vertices, which is this one, failed to collect data. So it's not receiving any value. And input parameter degree also failed to collect data because this is not passing any integer number. Okay? So in order for, for this component to work, these two here must work. So remember, each time in, in you find a, an orange component in a grasshopper definition, just pay attention if you have some orange component on the left, because this has problems, because these two have problems. Okay? So you must solve the initial problem in order to um, in cascade to have this component working properly. Okay? So let's focus on these two containers here. The point and the integer. Now the point says floating parameter point failed to collect data. So the problem here is that this component here is not receiving any points. Now this in particular as all the uh, component here in the params toolbar geometry and primitive um, can receive data from its input or can contain data inside itself. I do call these black components here containers. Okay, so this is a point container, this is an integer container. They can contain uh, only the type of data that they are programmed to. So for example, this can only contain points. If you try to, let's say, uh, pass some kind of uh, weird values like, not, I don't know, a circle to this thing here, it, it will, you will get an error, okay? So how do we fill a container with values? It depends, but in this time we don't have anything in our Rhino interface, we don't have anything in our Grasshopper, so the thing you might want to do is right-click on this container here and tell him, I want to fill you with points. How many points? Well, it depends on, on the use that you are uh, giving to these points. In this case, we need vertices for a curve. Now, how many vertices does this NURBS component uh, need at least in order to design a curve. So the minimum amount of points you, we must provide is not one, it's two. So we must set multiple points. When you do this, Grasshopper disappears, it gives you access to Rhino interface because this way you can select the points. Now, we don't have any geometric point in our interface, so we cannot select points, 
That's why Grasshopper asks through Rhino command line, which is what is the point location. So it's just like clicking wherever you want these points to be. Okay, so I will click here and there and then enter when you have finished selecting points. Now you see that this becomes gray and it says, I am a point container. I contain a collection of three dimensional points and these are the nine locally defined values. So these points here are defined locally. It means inside the point container. They are not being received by another function, okay? Same thing as the, for, for the integer. Now, how many degrees we must provide to the NURBS curve in order for it to work? One value, okay? And so we right click on this container here, set integer, not set multiple integer, just set one integer and give it the value that we want for, the, for our curve. So say I give one. One means linear NURBS curve, which is a polyline. So you see that we have this polyline here um, passing through the vertices that we have selected and closing because the Boolean toggle is set to true. Okay. Now you see that this is gray, this is gray, this is gray, and this is gray also because it is receiving all the information that it needs in order to work. Okay. Now you can see that this is light gray, this is dark gray. Uh, this, this depends on the preview of the component inside the Rhino interface. So you see that Grasshopper has no preview, no geometrical preview inside the canvas. Its preview happens inside the Rhino interface, in Rhino viewport. So when a component has a graphical preview in Rhino interface, it can be light gray. When, when a, a component has no graphical preview, so this is a number, there is no geometrical preview for this uh, value here, it doesn't matter the preview, so the component can only be dark gray. Okay. Now you see that if I select this container here, the points light up and a gumball appear with corresponds to any of them. This is the way that I can edit the point manually if I want. Okay. Also I can drag them up or down and create a three-dimensional uh, polyline in this case. Okay. And also if I select the NURBS curve, you see that the line lights up and becomes green. Okay, so this is the way that Grasshopper indicates if a component is active or selected or not. So standard preview is red and selected preview is green. Uh, you might see that also there is a small cross here that is getting green, very small. Uh, this is exactly this red cross actually becomes green, becomes green when I select the, the, the component. Okay. And then there is the Boolean toggle. I can double click here and you see that the polyline doesn't close anymore or switch it back to true. And I can change the degree. Now, for example, let's say I want to uh, change the degree so I can uh, create a polyline or a, a second degree curve or a third degree curve. Okay, so I must change the degree in this case. So what I, what I would do if I want to follow exactly the same workflow that we have already followed, then I will right click on the integer container, set integer and change it to two and commit changes. So you can see that now the curve switched, switched from uh, degree one to degree two. Okay. Um, but I also can switch to degree three, commit changes. And now I have a, a degree three nerves curve. Now we can do this. Uh, by changing the value inside the container like this, or we can use a number slider, which can provide different values by simply dragging the cursor around. Okay. Now, in this case, for example, I need to uh, feed the integer uh, container with a variable number using a number slider. I won't use the standard number slider because uh, it gives you a range between zero and one. So the only usable value here is one. Even if I give it 0 0.933, it, it, this integer container here will do the only thing that it can do. If I do this, will convert this value to the closer integer value uh, that it can find. So in this case, it can find. So in this case, it is one, okay? So the only thing that we can do here is set this slider to this value here. If we set it to a value which is lower than 0 0.5, this is what happens, okay? We have an error. 
Now, this is the third state for grasshopper component, which is the, it's not a warning, it's probably an error. So they become red, they get angry, okay? And it says degree must be higher than or equal to one, okay? So you see that it always generates a curve, but it's saying you are making a mistake with the value that, that you are providing into the degree input, okay? So there is no need for us to use an, a standard number slider. We must uh, create a custom number slider. One thing that we can do is double click on number slider here and change its range and change the type of value that it is outputting, okay? But I do prefer, instead of, of dragging one standard slider from the toolbar and then editing it, I do prefer to create directly the right type of number slider. And this can be done by double clicking here and start specifying the, the um, parameters for this number slider. So parameters for a number slider are three values or well, at least two values, okay? Uh, so let's start from with two, only two values. So first we specify the uh, smallest value for the number slider. So in this case, we must provide a degree and the component already tell, told us that we must provide one as the smaller value, okay? So one is our uh, first, um, well, it's basically the um, lowest value in the range for the slider. And then we use a minor symbol um, in order to specify that we are um, switching to the highest range for our uh, slider. And so we must provide what is the highest degree that we can use for our NURBS curve. Now, we won't get through um, NURBS topology consideration, so we will only use three for now. So one minor three means create a slider between one and three with integer numbers. And integer numbers, uh, it's, uh, it's determined by the fact that I am not saying 3.0, for example. If I do this, I will have a slider between one and three but where we will have access to 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, but as we need integer values, there is no need to specify decimal values here. So I will just use one smaller than three, and this is a slider that comes out exactly with the values that I need for our uh, degree. And once I have these, I will plug this into the point, uh, into the number container. So you see that I can simply change the type of curve that I get by switching uh, the degree from between one, two, and three. Of course, uh, in this case, for example, you might notice that this container here has become totally useless because I can also take this value here and plug it into the degree input without the need of uh, having an, a uh, mid here, mid integer container, okay? So if I do this and plug this cable inside degree, you see that when I plug a cable, a wire into an input, the previous input just disappears, okay? And you see that the function, the NURBS curve function works properly uh, as if it was connected to the integer container. So this thing here can be deleted, okay? So that's how you create, for example, a NURBS curve in, uh, in Grasshopper, a parametric NURBS, NURBS curve in Grasshopper. Um, so basically, um, this is the uh, way we set up the inputs. Now let's take a look at what happens inside this component. Of course, we have three sections, let's say so. Uh, first one are the inputs. They must be set properly, okay, set up properly. So the thing you might want to do is hover with the mouse over each of the input parameters and understand what type of data you must provide to this parameter in order for this component here to work properly. Okay, then there is the calculation, which is basically the function itself uh, working, and then there is the output. Okay, so you see that output has three uh, things here, which are the curve, length, and domain. Okay, now we won't go through the domain thing for now. We will just uh, focus on curve and length in order to understand that each function gives you access to a whole set of, uh, of aspects of your, of your uh, output, okay? So for example, we have the curve. Now the curve is the polyline curve in this case because our uh, degree is set to one. Now let's grab a panel, which can be taken from the toolbar or you can just double click and uh, just type, um, 
um, panel uh, command, which is this one, and then you just enter, and then you have this panel here, which is exactly like grabbing the component from the toolbar, as you can see. So just let's let's just plug the curve here, and you see that the panel contains the poly. Well, not contain. Yeah, it contains it, but it it shows you the description of the of the uh, input that is that it is receiving. Okay, you can you can pass data uh, through the panel if I. Uh, let's say drag a, a wire from here I am not passing the text polyline curve I will be passing the polyline itself so the panel it's only visualizing what value I, I have inside this uh, uh, flow here okay so it says polyline curve but if I increase this value it says periodic curve as well as if I increase to three okay so it says what type of geometry I am getting from the nerves curve of course, if I switch Boolean toggle to false, it says curve because it is no longer periodic. Okay, so you see that it, in, in real time we have the, the um, visual understanding of what's happening in, in, for the output of the nerves curve. Okay, but we also have the length. Okay, so if I plug the length into the panel, we have 150.769 and so on. So this is the length of this curve. Okay. Uh, which is something that might be useful if we want to, um, let's say, perform some kind of uh, um, intelligent um, operation on our design. For example, let's say I want to change the shape of this curve in order to have it measuring exactly, let's say, 100. Uh, so this is a design problem that can be solved using this length parameter here, but we will get into this later on. Okay. The domain, we will uh, not be considering this for now because it's something quite complex uh, if you don't have uh, enough uh, nerve, nerve topology understanding. So for now, just let's focus on the fact that a single function can give you uh, several outputs from the same uh, computation. Okay. Um, of course, we might want to take a look at what happens, for example, if I use a button here instead of uh, a uh, boolean toggle in order to have a closed result i must keep this button pressed if i release it i switch back to the false status which means open curve okay so that's why you might want to work with a, um, a standard boolean toggle thing um, so that's how grasshopper works in terms of that's how, how uh, any uh, of the functions that we have in in grasshopper interface works Remember, focus on the, the process that we uh, created here. Just focus on the type of data that you might uh, that you must use in order for a function, a specific function, to work. Also, you have a specific di uh, data type for the outputs. You see that this is saying a curve. The hexagon icon is this one, which is a curve container. Then there is the length, which is a floating point container. So, of course, the length um, could also be a non-integer value. And then there is a domain which has a, a particular uh, icon here that you can find inside your primitive here and it's a domain, uh, numeric domain uh, data type, okay? I repeat, we will discuss it later on. So uh, now that we have some kind of uh, initial understanding of, of how Grasshopper works, let's see how we can uh, take advantage of uh, uh, this uh, this workflow by start creating uh, some uh, relevant geometric construction. Okay, uh, we will be discussing the uh, other toolbars here um, along the way because uh, they are quite complex toolbar, especially the math and set, which are the more important toolbar in your Grasshopper interface, by the way. So um, we will discuss them uh, along the way because there is no uh, need for us to concentrate on each of the two, especially uh, because it will be boring and uh, some kind you will be scared and run away and just shut down the computer. Uh, but if you want this kind of uh, hardcore introduction to, to data manipulation, uh, you, especially as regards the, the sets toolbar, you might want to uh, check uh, the other video course that I have on Grasshopper, which is called exactly Data Manipulation, um, which contains all basically all the data manipulation that you can perform inside Grasshopper, which is something that we, we won't see in this uh, basic Grasshopper course. Uh, okay, We will only be using the necessary tools in order for our work workflow to work exactly. Okay, So uh, I will... Uh, 
take all of these and uh, I will just keep the uh, NURBS curve definition here and uh, I want to uh, start a new one but without starting a new uh, file so what I want to do is take this thing here and put it aside okay so the uh, usual thing that I do is uh, give a name to um, uh, the this particular group of, uh, of components here in order to recognize what's their uh, general function uh, so I normally uh, give a name to uh, uh, groups of functions uh, via a component which, which is called the scribble. Okay, so the scribble is a text that you can edit by double-clicking the standard text that appears. Okay, there are also other ways, but I do prefer this because it is clearly visible also from the distance. Okay, so even if you are looking at the general definition, you can always see the text that says double-click me, right? So if I double-click it, I just change this text to NURBS, well, actually, parametric NURBS curve creation, okay? So I know exactly what happens in, in, uh, in this part of my script. And then I take all of these things here, select all of them, and then control G and create a group. So a group is useful if you want to, uh, well, it's useful uh, from two points of view. First one, from a visual point of view, you understand that these components contained inside this rectangle here, they all create, they all work uh, for a specific purpose, okay? Uh, and the other thing is that if I group a set of components, if I want to move them from one side to another side, I just drag the rectangle and I move all the content to a different position, okay? Um, so this is what happens inside this uh, first uh, group here. I will select once again all of these uh, components here and control E to disable them. So um, let's spend a few words uh, about disabling uh, the, the preview of a component and disabling the whole component, okay? So I will, uh, let's say, control E once again, all of these. You see that we have um, some components which have a, a graphical preview, graphic preview inside, inside the Rhino interface, okay? And specifically, they are the points and the nerves curve, okay? So these two light gray components, if we right click on them, you see that we can turn off and on the preview of, of this component. So if I turn off the preview, this, this gets dark gray and I no longer see the preview of the points around the, the NURBS curve. As well as I right click here and hit preview, you see that I don't, I don't see the preview of the curve anymore. Okay, so uh, this is the way that we, um, let's say, turn off or on the preview of one component uh, in Grasshopper. Now the thing is that these components, even if their preview is off, they are still calculating the, the, the output, okay? So they are still using computer resources in order to perform their operation. Now in this case, um, they are very, very simple functions, so they don't require uh, a bunch of computer resources. But anyway, it's a good um, way of working that if you don't use a particular set of components anymore in your workflow, then you just don't uh, uh, turn the preview off. You turn the component off because this way it won't be calculating, okay? So if we want to switch preview on and off, you can select the component and control Q. So this allows to switch from preview on or off, okay? Also for the point, control, the preview is on, off, like this. Now, the thing with these switches here, keyboard switches, is that uh, they work like a, a toggle, like a switch. So if I have one component off and one is on, and I select both of them and control Q, I have this inversion of the preview on and off, okay? So say that I want both of them to be off, but I only have one on and one off. I cannot select everything here and control Q because else I have this kind of, of behavior here. So I middle uh, mouse button, this wheel appear here and I have access to the disable preview and disable preview and enable preview. So if I do this, I am disabling the preview for all the components that are selected. It's not a switch, okay? It's a common. 
and I can turn the preview on for all the components that have some kind of graphic preview. So of course there is no graphic preview from Boolean toggle, it will always stay dark gray as well as the number slider. Okay, so the same thing is happens with the, um, uh, the disabling the components. So if I select everything, if I know that everything is, is uh, uh, enabled right now, I can control E, of course. But if I don't, I can middle mouse button and then select the disable component here, disable command here. Okay, so normally when I end working with some kind of, of uh, um, small definition inside one single file, I select everything, control G, control E, so I have already grouped and deactivated all the, con all the content of this uh, uh, function group. Okay. So let's move on and let's start uh, working uh, with uh, um, some interesting geometric structure in, in Grasshopper because in the end we want to work with, uh, with, uh, with graphic outputs and, and design something. Okay? Uh, now, uh, being a, a programming interface, Grasshopper can be used also for some uh, uh, numeric manipulation without any graphic uh, result. Okay? Um, so it's up to you basically but i i uh, i think that uh, most of you will be interested in uh, in uh, uh, graphic applications so let's start uh, dealing with one of the basic structures in in grasshopper which is called the attractor structure now uh, over the years i've developed my own uh, my own method for working with attractors and i um, divide attractors into three families okay so I will point them out here with another scribble and then I will say we are going to work with attractors and uh, let's specify the three types which are concentrated attractors and diffused attractors and vector sorry vector or 3d attractors okay so these are uh, the three families of attractors that we will be discussing um, in this first uh, class um, and uh, we will see what's their potential. Uh, so let's start with, uh, with the concentrated one. So concentrated attractors are basically geometry uh, that um, perform some kind of action over other geometries. Okay? And this geometry, of course, these geometries are of course concentrated. So basically um, we will be dealing with uh, mainly two types of, of concentrated attractors, which are the point and the curve. Okay, so let's start with the first one, which uh, I will say like one concentrated uh, attractors, specifically point. Okay, so let's start with this. And uh, let's switch to the top viewport. There is no need to work in 3D right now uh, because these will uh, uh, act on the XY plane for now. So let's see how, the, how, how these uh, um, uh, concentrated attractors with point theory uh, work. So let's create a point container. And this will be set one point will be our attractor point, okay? Now, in order for, have some, for having some kind of attraction, we need also the remaining geometry, which will be the target for the attraction action. Okay, so for now, I will create another point container. But in this case, I would say set multiple points. And I will only, only say, let's say, um, I would take one, two, three points. Okay. So what happens now, I have two different sets of points. One set is containing just one locally defined value, which is one point, which is the attractor. And this point set is containing three values here, which are the remaining geometry, okay? So what I want to do, I want to create some kind of interaction between the attractor and the remaining points. Now, when I say interaction, it means I want something to happen between them, okay? And the easiest thing that, that could happen between them is a line connecting the attractor with each of the three uh, surrounding points. So we can uh, create a line a function in Grasshopper. We can go into the curve and primitive and find the line between two points here, or we can type line and here we have the line between two points. 
be aware I'm not selecting this thing because this would be a line container okay so anytime you see a an hexagonal icon you are talking about containers and data type okay not creating something from something uh, already present in grasshopper okay so I must create a line between two points I already have the two points well actually I have one point here and three points here okay so this thing here is creating one interaction so one line between the center point and each of the three surrounding points okay so now we I don't want to scare you right now so I won't go through this at this moment but later on we will discuss why this happened and who decides that this is happening because grasshopper could also create one connection between the center point and the first of the three surrounding points thus creating just one line okay but no it is creating one line per each surrounding point okay we will discuss this later on okay uh, so we have these three lines and this is pretty normal so this is why grasshopper this is how grasshopper works normally okay but let's say that I want to connect this point only to those surrounding points that are close enough to the attractor point okay so this is when the relationship becomes an attraction relationships which is based basically on distance so if I say I want to connect only the points that are close enough it means that I must know the distance between the center point and the surrounding points and then consider for the connection only those surrounding points that are close enough which means whose distance is smaller than a specific reference value okay so this is what I'm going to do right now um, so before creating the line which is the last step of our definition I need to know what's the distance between these two point sets so instead of, of drawing a line I'm going to use a distance command which is exactly like in Rhino so if you want to know where the distance command is uh, you must go into a vector where you have some things which are related to points and here you will find the distance component but anyway I do recommend that you get used to typing things in uh, in grasshopper uh, even if you if you um, are, are not speaking English basically uh, it's easy to to uh, define the English word for the, the operation that you want to perform and just type it here into the command line okay so I want to calculate the distance between the center point and all of the three points and as we saw with the line grasshopper is creating an interaction between this point and all the three surrounding points so here if we grab a panel we have the three distances already calculated by the distance component okay um, so what I want to do I want to um, isolate or well I want to dispatch and uh, subdivide the surrounding points into two groups the group of points that are close enough from the group of points that are too far to be connected to the attractor point okay so once we know the distances we must understand which of this distance is smaller than a specific value so let's start from specifying the reference distance that we want to use for subdividing the points into closer and farther points okay so I will create a slider here uh, that represents the, the um, limit um, defining which points are close enough or which points are too far so this distance can be a value between zero and in this case distance as you can see is a floating point number so I can also consider zero point a couple of decimal values here uh, which is the smallest distance and then the the highest value could be anything um, let's say high enough to include all the possible distances that we have in this uh, uh, point structure here so you can see that each of these uh, square of our grid measures 5 by 5 so I would say that if I give this slider a top value of 20 I'm already considering the farther distance that I have in, in this structure okay so I would say 20 there is no need to say 20.00 because we already specified two decimal, decimal numbers here so there is no need to put them here as well so 0, 0.00 to 20 generates this slider from 0 to 20 with two decimal numbers so this would be our reference distance and what we must do is understand if 
sum of this, any of this distance is smaller than this value here. Okay, so smaller than is actually minor. So if I type this, I have direct access to smaller than function. Of course, I can also type smaller than, okay, but this is a logic operator, just like mathematical operation. Uh, for example, if I want to perform an addition, I can also type addition, okay, but I can also type plus. So it's the same for the logical operator. And logical and mathematical operation are, of course, in the maths toolbar. You can see that operators are here, and you have mathematical here, and you have uh, the uh, logical operators here. So in this case, I will minor, and then I want to compare the distances that I have calculated in comparison with the reference distance that I have here. Um, this is a question, basically. So the smaller than component is saying, is the first number smaller than the second number? Then the possible answer are yes or no. Okay. So in this case, for example, if I take a look at the smaller than output, I will see that this is true, true, true. Now, um, these are, in, in fact, as you can see from the hexagonal uh, icon, uh, these are Boolean values, okay? So it's a true false. So that's the output of the smaller than function. It only understands if one value is smaller than the other one. So you see that our distances are 5, 10, 11. So I'm providing 12 as the second number. So each of these three distances is smaller than 12. But if I decrease this, you see that now the, the third value is getting false because it is 11.33 and I am giving 11.17, okay? So if I decrease this more, even the second value becomes false. And if I decrease it more, less than five, I have three falses here, okay? So this three, this smaller than reacts to the uh, parameter, which is the reference distance. Now, once I know this, I want to uh, subdivide our points here into two groups. The group of points whose distance is smaller than this value, which is represented by these two true values here, from the group of points which distance is far or it's higher than the reference value, which is this one. And uh, subdividing a data set into two groups means dispatching the values from one list into two lists. Okay, so the values that I want to dispatch are the points here, not the smaller than, but the, the data that I want to consider for the final interaction are the surrounding points. Okay, and I want to dispatch them using a dispatch pattern. Now, the dispatch pattern is by default. You can see that there are two locally defined values here, which by the way are the uh, hexagonal uh, Boolean icon means that they are two false values. And the two locally defined values are a one true and one false. Now, what does it mean? It means that when we get here the three points, the first one will receive a true, while the second one will receive a false. But there is also a third one. And when the amount of values here is larger than the amount of, uh, of um, Boolean values, these Boolean values will repeat. So having said here true and false means eventually that there is a sequence of true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false, alternated true, false values forever until we call all the incoming values uh, here in the list input. Okay. Uh, so basically what we will have here is three values. The first and the third one are receiving a true. So six and three, you can see the first coordinate of these points will be in list A. While the, the point having x coordinate 19 is receiving a false, which we, because it's the second value, and it will be sent to list B. While if I use the dispatch pattern that comes from the smaller than, now it's different because the first two points here are receiving a true because their distance is smaller than this value here. So in list A, I will only have the points that are closer to the attractor point. 
while in list B, I will have the only point whose distance is uh, higher than this value here. Okay, so if I create a line here um, and uh, connect the attractor with the points coming from list A, now I am only connected this attractor point here to the closer points. Okay, and if I decrease this, it will connect only to the point which uh, lies at the distance smaller than 895. And if I decrease this, eventually at a distance which is smaller than 5, which is the smallest distance that we have here, no point will be connected to the attractor because this smaller than is only giving us three falses. So all the points coming inside the list will receive a false, so they will all be sent to the list B and none will be sent into list A, so there will be no incoming endpoint. You see that this cable is getting orange because it is empty. So this line is receiving the start point and no end point, no value inherited from one source. So there will be empty line parameter here, okay? So now what's the power of this uh, uh, small, small definition? The power is in, lies in this. Of course, I could also set multiple points by hand, like clicking around randomly in, in the viewport like this. Okay, and you see that now I have a whole bunch of points that I can connect to the attractor point and I can also take the geometric parameter here which is the attractor point and move it around connecting it to the surrounding point maximum to this distance here just like some kind of giant spider walking around here. Okay, uh, but um, I won't use the uh, point container and I won't be right clicking and set multiple points and then clicking around randomly because th this is insane. Okay, I, I'm, I will use Grasshopper in order to create a population of points here using one other important command in Grasshopper which is called the populate 2D command. Okay. You see that there are, um, basically in your installation, you will find one, two, and three populate commands, populate 2D, populate 3D, and populate geometry. They are in the vector toolbar inside the grid group. You will find these three commands here, populate, populate, and populate geometry. Okay. So in this case, we are working in two dimension. So I will use a populate 2D. And you see that populate 2D is creating a population of 100 random points inside one rectangular region, okay? So if I want to uh, use this component in order to avoid this uh, thing here, I must do a couple of things. First of all, I want this population of points to appear inside the region which is wider than the actual one. So you see that region parameter already says I have one locally defined value, which is a rectangle, which has a width of 20 and a height of 10, okay? But I want to change this rectangle. Now, in order to keep it, um, let's say, um, let's say with the same workflow that we have created right now, uh, I should create a rectangle here, parameterize the width and height of the rectangle and plug it into region, but, if I don't want to give any particular meaning to this uh, region, as I don't want right now, I just need a rectangle like, for example, let's say like this, okay? So if I want, and I don't care about the position and dimension exactly uh, the parameters, okay? So what I, what I can do is just right click on region and set one rectangle and pick the rectangle that I want to use like this. So this is something that you can do. Um, it is an implicit way of defining the parameters inside the function itself. And uh, uh, it's very quick, as you can see, but it has some, uh, some cons. And the principal cons here are that this implicit way of constructing your script makes it not clearly understandable, even from, from you. Because if you don't remember what you did inside this component and you reopen this definition in a month from now, then you won't remember what you did here and you, you won't be able to easily understand who is defining the region where you are working in, okay? So it's different to implicitly define this uh, rectangle here than creating a rectangle 
plug it into the region and giving this rectangle an, a specific x size and y size with a number slider, for example, or a, an explicit parameter. Like, for example, using a slider, I will introduce here a standard uh, one of the standard sliders that we can create. I call it slider 11. So slider 11 automatically creates a slider between 0 and the multiple of 10, which is higher than the value that we have specified. So the multiple of 10, which is um, uh, higher than 11, is 100. Okay, The power of 10, sorry. So if I say slider 11, I will get a slider between 0 and 100 with integer values because I wrote 11 without any decimal number. If I say slider 5, I will get a slider between 0 and the, the next power of 10 um, larger than 5, which is 10. Okay. If I say slider 101, I will get from 0 to 1000 and so on. Okay. So these are my... Uh, uh, standard slider that I use normally. I will say slider 11 here because I want something to range with around 20 of, of width and height. So I will set this as X size and you see I have this uh, uh, varying size for, for the rectangle. And then I copy paste this and plug it into Y. Okay. So you see that it's clearly understandable which region we are using right now because it is created inside Grasshopper using a rectangle component and some explicit number slider affecting the uh, populate 2D. Okay, And also we have some other parameters here. I will only focus for now on the count. Count is the amount of points that we want to uh, create inside this rectangle. And by default it says 100. Okay, But you can use, for example, an Another time, a one-on-one -on -one slider, in order to have the possibility to create more than 100 points, plug it here, and you see that you can create as many points as you want, up to 1,000. Okay, see how Grasshopper is becoming slower when you reach, when you, uh, let's say, pass 400, 500, Grasshopper starts to slow down. Okay. So just remember that there is lots of calculation going on and especially there is some rendering going on because Rhino Preview is actually a real-time rendering of what's happening in Grasshopper. So even a bunch of points can stress the graphic card a, quite a little. Okay, So let's keep it low like 170 and these are the points that we want to use for our uh, concentrated attractor uh, definition. So uh, as we already did with uh, the integer number when we created our uh, slider here. I can bypass this uh, point container here containing the point cloud and uh, connect the populate to D both to point B and to the list for the dispatch. Okay. Now in order to do this I can drag two additional cables like this and this and you see that things are already starting to work but I can also do another thing which is Control shift and drag these cables from where they are plugged right now to the new component. Okay, so just one single operation in order to bypass this and being able to delete it because we no longer need it. Okay, so this is our um, uh, point attractor definition here working with a point cloud which is already uh, also parametric. Okay, so we can define like this, you can see that it all affects our uh, definition like this and then increase or decrease the amount of number and then increase or decrease the reference distance and have this spider becoming smaller and we also have the geometric parameter here which is the spider itself walking around in our point cloud. Okay, um, So this is how the, the um, attractor point attractor definition works. Uh, I will get rid of this panel here in order to get things a little more uh, organized and, and clearly uh, visible. And this is how the attraction um, uh, interaction work with in case of, uh, of uh, um, point. And uh, the next step will be to uh, implement some, well, I wouldn't say some more complex, but um, some, some kind of, uh, uh, let's say, in, uh, double interaction using not just one attractor point, but using a couple of uh, uh, attractor points. Okay, And we will have the occasion in this case to start talking about 
uh, data sets and lists and uh, data trees.